the dental clinic and the medical clinic were connected with each other. So I did a lot of work in the medical clinic too, as far as just clean up. And so I was always, I was, I was a really curious person. As I, as I started learning about bacteria and viruses and different things and how small they are and what they do, I was, I was always asking the medical staff and the people I was working for for um, information on different things. And so MRSA was one of them because it was around and I wanted to know about it. And so I had read a lot about how you, you know, how is appropriate to treat it, what types of things you can do with or without drugs. And there's a lot that, that can and should be done immediately as soon as a healthcare provider suspects that somebody has MRSA, especially if you're in a prison or um, a locker, you know, if a football team, whatever. If you're somewhere where there's gonna be a lot of people, there are certain things you should do about it. The first is to, you know, teach the patient how to keep from spreading it to other parts of their body and other people. And then, you know, kind of depending on the severity of the infection, you know, cleaning, covering, draining, all those different types of things that can be done. This is all even without antibiotics. Because with MRSA, you really, you're kind of hit and miss with, you know, what it's resistant to and what, what's actually gonna work. And so people would show up with these infections and they would get sent away with oozing, draining sores back out into the prison, on, on the prison yard, the compound, back to their cells, without any instruction explaining to them how to, to you know, maintain proper hygiene. And so I kind of started to get upset when I was watching this happen, you know, and it got worse and worse. And <clears throat> um, so I was, I was upset at that. I was upset at, you know, the, the lack of, uh, dental care that was going on and so I was like what should I do so you can write to members of Congress um, as privileged mail to like to your attorney and so I was like I'm gonna write to one of the senators from Oregon and explain all this and see see if they care at all and so I wrote a, a long letter to Senator Gordon Smith's office and I don't think he's a senator anymore but he was at the time and just to see you know if somebody would respond and I was kind of hoping that he wouldn't write back. You know, I, I sent him a letter. I said, you can use my name if you have to, but I would really prefer you not because I'm kind of at their mercy here and I fear retaliation. And so he wrote a letter back, to, or his office wrote a letter back to me and said, thank you, you know, we'll, uh, we'll get on this. And I was like, crap, nobody else here is gonna be getting letters from Gordon Smith. And as soon as they show up here, if they really do asking questions or call somebody, they're gonna know exactly where that information came from. Um, because the only place that information could have came from was either a staff member or me. That's it. And so, anyway, um, a few days later, all these people start getting called up and getting treated because they knew who it was who had the stuff. You know, because I put a lot of detail in there, in that letter about what was going on and you know, the stuff that I knew and what I thought should probably happen based on the things that I had read, you know, quoted different articles and stuff that I had, not just me, Mr. Inmate who knows nothing, um, kind of explaining what should be done and what's not being done. But all the people who had MRSA that I knew of started getting called up and getting treated appropriately. And then I got fired. <laughs> um, they, uh, I remember I showed up to work one day and the, the administrator from medical met me and kind of stopped me and he said, so um, your services here are no longer required. Um, he said, if you need to get anything, you know, go ahead, but um, we just, we don't need you around here anymore. And the lady who I worked for, the, the hygienist who, who hired me initially, they didn't tell her why I got fired because she saw me later on that day and she's like, what the heck happened? And I was like, they didn't tell you? She goes, no. And uh, so I explained to her and she kind of looked at me, she was like, well, at least it was for a good reason. And because uh, she is actually one of the staff members who was um, like, hey, maybe we should do this or this. And basically was, from what I understand, kind of said, if you like your job, just shut up. Um, and so, and I put that in the letter too, because I knew that kind of stuff was going on. And then a lot of the, the officers in the prison who knew what I had done, they privately thanked me because they said that's not something we could bring up. You know, it's not. You know, it's, and it's a threat to them. It's a threat to their families because they bring that kind of stuff home. It's not just the inmates who were threatened. It was 
all of the staff members and their families and the surrounding community. So when the VA scandal erupted, you weren't surprised? Not at all. <laughs> I was like, yeah, business as usual, huh? And But then uh, I, uh, th there was one lady who, who had run a dental lab uh, a dental lab tech program at the prison that got shut down by the warden before I showed up in the prison. But they couldn't fire her because it's hard to fire federal government employees. And so they had to give her a different job and she worked in the education department. So she knew why I had gotten fired and she gave me a job over there as a clerk um, and also teaching a class that all the institution, uh, basically the janitors, had to take, um, teaching them about infection control and chemicals and, you know, all of the different, all the stuff I had learned as a dental assistant, basically teaching them the importance of it. And so it actually worked out really good. And I did that until I got out.